congratulations on going public today. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the company itself, um, because of the way this has been described, Ginkgo seeks to make programming the DNA of cells as easy as programming computers. I mean, that sounds very exciting. Yeah. It also sounds very hard. What does it entail? Okay, so the core idea is inside of every cell, right, every plant, animal, microbe, is digital code in the form of DNA, mm -hmm. right? It's ATCs and Gs, not zeros and ones like in a computer, but you can read that code, DNA sequencing, like genomics, and you can write it with DNA printing. And so what we do at Ginkgo is we have a big 200,000 square foot lab in Boston where we read and write genetic code to program cells for customers. And then we make money kind of like Apple would in the App Store. If we program a cell for you, we get a royalty on the sales of the products that come from that cell. That's the business model. Yeah, and of course, that was exactly my next question, which is this idea of cell programming. I mean, with many biotechs, I think historically yeah. it's been you create a product or a suite of products and then you patent them, you sell them. You're taking a much more horizontal approach, almost like the way we see AWS or one of the big cloud players targeting a variety of industries. Uh, yeah, 100%. So, so the, the model is actually, yeah, stolen from tech. I mean, I, mean, I think this is why we're the, you know, with $1.6 billion, the largest biotech IPO in history, is because we're, we're not bringing a drug out to market. What we're bringing out is a platform, right? It is like an operating system or, or an AWS or an app store. And the idea is if we're successful, all of those apps should ultimately run on Ginkgo's platform. That, that's really what we're hoping to achieve. Okay, so that business, the cell programming business, is basically your so-called foundry business. You also have another business that's focused on biosecurity that's much more tied to COVID, for example, testing in schools, yes. being one of those key pieces. That's been growing particularly fast. Yeah. Um, so how are you looking at the growth of those two businesses, uh, not only yeah. through the rest of this year, but beyond. I mean, how sustainable is that biosecurity piece of the business? Yeah, you know, it's a good problem to have to have two fast-growing businesses. Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we've, we've signed about uh, four, more than $400 million of contracts with states around the country in the last few months around K-12 testing. And the way we look at this is if we're going to make it as easy to program cells as it is to program computers, just like Google would invest in cybersecurity, we should be investing in biosecurity. And what COVID has shown us is we're not really prepared for this sort of thing. And so, so part of that business is the testing. The, the other work we've done, we just announced a partnership with Aldevron, one of the big mRNA vaccine manufacturers, where we gave them a program cell that improved the production of one of the ingredients for mRNA vaccines tenfold. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we'll get royalties on that just like we normally do, but it also speeds the scale and, and productivity of mRNA vaccines for biosecurity. Okay. So the pandemic, at least right now, and where that part of the business is concerned, uh, continues to be a growth driver. In terms of looking across the broader platform and the different industries you work with, where do you see the other greatest growth opportunities? Yeah, so I think you'll see us actually do more in therapeutics. We announced a deal with Biogen earlier this year in the area of gene therapy. But if you look at the kind of project Ginkgo does, you know, we, we've worked with a company called Kronos up in Canada, uh, Zaltria's JV, that does uh, cannabis production. So we engineer a cell to produce cannabinoids so you don't have to grow the fields. We work in animal-free meat with a company called Motif Foodworks. We work in antibiotics with Roche. Like, the range of, of places you can apply this is really broad. And so the thing I'm most excited coming up, startups, small companies. You should be able to launch a new company on Ginkgo's platform without building a lab. You can just have an idea for a cell program. We'll huh. do the biotech, and you can commercialize. And that's exactly like what the folks at Motif did. They're, they're food scientists. They're, they're expert food people, right? They're making, like, impossible burgers. They didn't have to have any biotech people. Ginkgo handled all that. It's like outsourcing to the cloud if you were starting a website. Same idea. So startups is really where I want to grow. Uh, hey, Jason, it's uh, David back here at Post 9. Um, you know, I read through the risk factors, and we should point out risk factors in, a, in an S1 are just that. Many of them don't actually happen, but you've got to list them. Yep. Nonetheless, it's not often you see one that sort of talks about the potential for malevolent purposes from third parties who, uh, you know, who gain um, uh, access to some of your uh, engineered cell materials. How big a concern is that? Because it kind of sounds pretty scary. Yeah, so I think there's two halves to this. So one is sort of like the software industry would have needed to deal with, like, piracy because it's very easy to copy software. I think as you see more cell programs out in the world, you're going to need sort of legal structures to make sure people can't steal them and that sort of thing and, and pirate it. That's one half of it. And then the other is, is biosecurity. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the reality is we, we are entering the age of biotechnology. I mean, you know, Ginkgo being the biggest life science IPO, it's a moment, right? It's a moment for synthetic biology. It's a moment for programming cells. That's going to come into our lives. And if we're going to do that safely and responsibly, we do need to invest in biosecurity. And, and this is why COVID-19, it, it's, it's nice. It's, it's kind of like cybersecurity happening before the Internet. 
right, instead of us having to catch up after the fact, right. all of what we're building up now in the U.S. and worldwide, it will help us with those problems. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, speaking of biosecurity, I mean, there are those who believe that uh, that COVID actually did come out of a, a lab in Wuhan uh, accidentally, perhaps, yeah. or most likely. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, I think it could have it could have been an accident. It could have not. I don't think it was engineered or anything like that. I think that's definitely not the case. Um, in terms of the foundry business, break even in 2024, 2025, how do you get there? So basically increasing the number of programs we're doing. So we actually okay. just updated. You know, we had we ended last year with about 50 cell programs for customers. We were saying we we're going to hit 23 this year. We just updated that to 30. Next year, we want to do more than 60. And then by 2024, we want to be adding 500. And so it's really about adding new programs onto the platform. It drives our costs down because the facilities in Boston, it's robotics and automation. It's like... Intel or Ford, the more of this work we do, it gets cheaper. This is why people are moving to us, right? And, and so that, that's the big way that we, we hit those numbers, is we keep just scaling the business and riding that kind of cost curve down. Yeah, and I guess just to dig into that business model a little bit more, you mentioned the fees. Yeah. I mean, so, so it's almost like you have, for example, startups that I know you're excited to get on board the platform. Yeah. Is it, it, it almost becomes biotech or I guess biotech innovation as a service? Is That's that right. the way to think about it? Exactly, yeah. So for like a one to three, like let's take this project for our you know, That was about a one year project to program that cell. If we were doing that work with a customer, we'd often get paid fees, right? So just, you know, like Amazon would get paid for usage compute. And then at the end, we give it to them and that's when the app store revenue kicks in. So now we get a royalty from Aldebaran in the future. Well, that just pays, you know, 100% margin. That's a great business. And so those are the two halves of it. It helps offset and make, make the company uh, more solvent in the near term to bring in the cash on R&D. But really, what we're, where the real value is, is all the downstream value share of the app store. And just to wrap this up, I mean, stock's up 19% right now. Yeah. You've raised $1.6 billion through this merger process. Yeah. Where will that go? So... Here's what I'll say. We, we want to invest more in building out scale on those platforms. Okay. Um, you know, one, one thing that's cool about this today, um, it, it's a moment to, to tell the public about programming cells, right? Like, we put a dinosaur on the outside of the stock exchange. Like, like kids, my, my kids hit the bell today. Like, kids are obsessed with biology. We grow up know, knowing it's wondrous, and then we forget about it, or we're told it's not important. That, that's not the next 50 years. It's not computers. It's, it's going to be biology and DNA. And, and you know, trading is DNA and, and being up today with this scale is just awesome. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.